Professor Goodyear, you've done a great deal of work in the area of depression in children. Perhaps you could begin by giving us some idea of how common a disorder this is. Uh, well, it depends on the age of the child, and we know more about adolescent prevalences than we do about childhood and preschoolers. In adolescents, I think we're pretty clear that the one-year prevalence rate is between 3 and 5 percent, broadly across most studies across most countries. So for every 100 children between the ages of 13 and 16 that we might go and interview, between three and six of them will tell us that over the last year they've had an episode of depression. About half of those would be severe enough for us to be concerned about giving them some treatment. In childhood, less clear cut, but we might, we might think that about one child in every hundred between the ages of five and 11 would say this, they've been depressed in the last 12 months. Perhaps the most interesting area is in the under fives. I think most of us probably thought it was a pretty uncommon event in the under fives. But some recent work, not yet epidemiologically based, would suggest we should be careful and that there may be more depressed young people than we had previously considered, perhaps harking back a bit to the messages given to us by people in the 1940s and 50s who thought there were quite a lot of depressed children under five, then we thought probably not. Like most things, I think there might be more than we currently think where the figures are said to be very rare. I'm not sure it's very rare under five. The other problem with numbers is that we do have to remember the sex differences. So in working backwards, the preschool uh, information doesn't really yet tell us much about sex differences. But between 5 and 11, we've probably got about the same number of boys as we have for girls. But I'm not sure that the boys do as well. And if we include depressed boys with a high level of irritability and mood dysregulation, then those boys will become depressed in adolescence and they won't do very well. The girls between 5 and 11 seem to do a bit better and there seem to be slightly less continuity with irritability and depression into adolescence, but it's a, it still requires some more work. By the time you get to adolescence and puberty and maturation, we see a, a very robust distinction in which girls between the ages of 13 and 17 in particular show about twice as many depressed episodes over a 12-month period as do boys. So this is a common disorder that's relatively common, but from what I understand the clinical picture then may be somewhat different depending yeah. on the ages. Could you give us some idea what the key clinical findings might be in each age? Yes. There, there's, interestingly, there's been very, very few studies that disaggregate symptom profiles in a statistically meaningful way over time. We've tended to use the diagnostic shorthand procedure to talk about continuity. If you were depressed as a child, will you be depressed as an adolescent? But we haven't said if you have this pattern of features when you're five or six or seven, what will that tell us about the continuity for features when you're 16 and 17 and 18? Very little work's been done on that. Now, if you look at adolescence, um, it does look as though, broadly speaking, the commonest feature is to do with your recognition that you're depressed, your sad mood, and your negative thoughts, the rather traditional and classic model. But in childhood, what work's been done more on clinical populations than on epidemiological ones, the children don't seem to be so aware of their depressions. They might look sad, but they don't report feeling sad. And they tend not to report negative thoughts about themselves, the world, and others, but they do tend to report more the notion that they might be a bad person or even that they're no good in a more generic sense. Physical symptoms, when they're present, can often be more stable. So the depressed child can have sleep difficulties, poor physical activity, loss of appetite, as can the depressed adolescent. But the somatic physical features are relatively infrequent in both age groups. So if you drew a map which is not scientific, but took what we knew from all kinds of studies, even the preschoolers, 
we can see that physical symptoms and social withdrawal are relatively uncommon, but quite continuous across the three years to 20 years. Negative cognitions, I feel bad about myself, the world and others, tend to cluster more in the adolescent age group. And the sense of being a bad person, I'm no good, I don't deserve to be here, in a more generic sense, is prominent in childhood, uncommon in the preschooler, and can persist into adolescence. As these things move through these maturational periods, adolescents become more likely to do something to themselves. So suicidal risk goes up with adolescents. But some studies have shown, worryingly, that if a child prepubertally does have suicidal uh, tendencies, particularly if they're male, they may well do something very, very bad to themselves very quickly and very unexpectedly. So even a, as a child? Even as a child. So although it's rare in childhood, a, a true suicidal act in a child can be quite mortal, but it's very, very uncommon. In adolescence, you have a kind of model which says, do adolescents have a lot of thoughts where they think they might kill themselves? Well, a lot of depressed adolescents will say that. If you then take, let's say, 100 adolescents who said, yes, I've had thoughts about killing myself, if you then ask the question, have you actually planned to kill yourself, only about half would say, well, a little bit. And if you then said, of that half, how many of you have actually worked out and carried out an attempt to kill yourself? Very few have done that. So even suicide, although suicidal ideation can be relatively common, its real meaning is rather cloudy in adolescence. Suicidal action is clear cut. But it's not as common as all that. It's not as common now, sadly, as, for example, substance misuse, which is clearly becoming a major public health issue amongst the mood disordered adolescents, and I fear, sadly, also amongst the mood disordered child. The other symptom issue that's rather problematic <coughs> is the non-depressive features that go with depression across this age range. It looks like in the preschool and in the early school years, you get a lot of externalizing behavioral issues. Irritability, antisocial behavior, destructiveness, the kinds of things that might lead us to think you're not depressed. Particularly, perhaps, the primary care physicians and primary care workers. They'll see difficult and disturbed behavior, but they may not observe depressive behavior. By the time you get to adolescence, the comorbidities get more complicated. One of the most enduring comorbidities is obsessional behaviors. And at least in our studies, obsessive compulsive behaviors and disorders are one of the most predictive components for what kind of treatment you might need. And they don't seem to do quite as well as depressions without OCD. Well, given that you mentioned treatment, could you just briefly tell us a little bit about what we really know about treatment both its advantages and perhaps some of the risks? Well, we know much more about the treatment of adolescents than we do about children or preschoolers. There is now good enough randomized controlled trials, both from the United States and the UK and Australia, which show us that the first thing we should remember is if you make a diagnosis of moderate to severe depression, you should be treated. There seems clear-cut evidence that in adolescents, treatment of any kind is better than no treatment at all. Within the spectrum of treatments, however, I think we're still rather uh, got problematic difficulties. By and large, the treatment studies show that probably the best treatment to give is a psychosocial treatment of some kind or another with fluoxetine, specifically. And this combination of treatment has been shown in two studies to be, on average, slightly more effective than treatments alone, and certainly more effective than no treatment at all. So if I was giving advice, uh, I would say good mental health management, straightforward problem-solving advice, mental hygiene, clean up the mental wound, but be prepared to give fluoxetine rapidly, because you do not want depression to last long. We know that the longer it lasts, the more problems you've got later. So adolescence is becoming a little clearer. Unfortunately, 
Even with that treatment program, we know that we're not going to get more than about a 50% response rate in adolescents. And clearly we've got to think very hard about why hitting them quite quickly and quite hard with combined psychosocial and pharmacological treatments is still only producing perhaps no more than a 50 or 60% response rate, at least in the short term. Now in childhood, we have really no systematic good evidence base. And at the moment, when you look at all the things that people have done, small studies, anecdotes, follow-up studies, one or two randomized controlled trials of small size, my own conclusion is that antidepressants should not be the treatment of choice. And I would prefer to see psychosocial approaches somewhat longer than I would in adolescence. For example, I might think that in adolescence we should try four to six weeks of psychosocial approaches at the most. And if there's no clear-cut response, I'd be for prescribing fluoxetine properly and sensibly from there on. Childhood, I might think to myself, I think I might go for 12 to 20 weeks and make sure I've really got a good handle on all the psychological and social components, including the family, school-based problems, the peer group if possible, before moving to antidepressants. But having said that, I think there's a difficulty because the child who might be responsive to antidepressants, in my clinical experience, responds well and quickly. And there you've got yourself a dilemma. We don't have the clinical descriptive tools to describe in the prepubertal child where that uncommon, possibly rare, but probably uncommon case where you want to say, I'm going to give you, I know you might find this odd, mum, but I want to go straight to antidepressants for your particular child. So how do I do that? Well, I think of four things. First of all, I think any pre pubertal child who has psychotic or true suicidal actions, I think could be antidepressants. If they have a family history of unipolar or bipolar depression, I think could be antidepressants. If their father has a history of alcoholism and you're unclear about the, a depressive history, I think maybe antidepressants. And then finally, if there's a history of treatment for depression in first degree relatives, with which has been successful, but people aren't sure about the diagnosis, I think of anti... So I, if I add those up and they score four, I'm thinking you may be nine, you may have a lot of irritability, your clinical picture is so-so, but I'm thinking I'm not going to wait 12 weeks to give you antidepressants if you don't respond pretty quickly to my straightforward psychosocial approaches. So there's a kind of clinical, pragmatic approach to the, to the prepubertal child. The most difficult of all still for me in the areas of research is what do you do with the under fives? And as things stand, um, I don't have a treatment approach to the under fives other than a pretty straightforward one of parental care, mental hygiene, and I would be very reluctant to prescribe uh, in my, with my UK hat on any kind of medication to an under five-year-old at, at this present time. I have, I have done it, but it's been so rare, it's once or twice in the last 20 years. Well. It sounds like there's been a lot of progress and a lot of movement in the field. One last question. What do you think is over the horizon for us? Uh, I think that's what's over the horizon is hopefully a uh, far less reliance on diagnostic classification because we will get to the endophenotypes and the intermediate biology. So it's just, uh, as I was saying to some others before, you know, if you go back to the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus, 150 years ago, it was quite straightforward. You tasted the urine. If it was sweet, you had diabetes, and if it was sour, you did not. Now, we're not tasting the urine, but we're not that much further on. We're tasting mental symptoms and trying to decide if someone has a descriptive psychopathology with which we then want to impart treatments. I'd like to think we'll get better experimental data to improve our understanding of the biology of the conditions, including those where there isn't any biology, so we can remove pseudo-diagnosis, and we'll get a much better handle through that investigative procedure of experimental medicine on who to treat and who to give what for whom. And that's what I'd like to see. Well, thank you. It's been a wonderful uh, uh, lesson, and I greatly appreciate it. Thank you for asking the questions.